Today we are fortunate to welcome Mr. P. Sainath, a renowned journalist, author and social activist. Considered as a father of rural journalism for his groundbreaking and insightful reporting on the harsh reality of agrarian crisis, poverty, systematic inequalities that persist in the rural country of the By focusing on the stories of the underprivileged, Mr. Sainath has ignited a national dialogue on issues often sidelined by mainstream media. Actually, Sri Amachisen has called him one of the world's great experts on famine and hunger. A champion for the rights of the oppressed, Sainathji has extensively covered caste discrimination and its ramification on marginalized communities. His fearless reporting has brought attention to the deep-rooted social hierarchies that continue to perpetrate injustice and hinder progress in India. For his passionate commitment as a journalist to restore the rural poor, to India's National Consciousness, he won Ramon Negasasi Award in 2007 and Fukaka Grand Prize, one of the Japan's most esteemed international awards, for his contribution to preserving the distinct and diverse cultures of the Asian region. Given that we are celebrating our 75th independence year, it only apt that we know who are our freedom fighters and what they fought for. He brought us a book, The Last Heroes, Foot Soldiers of the Indian Freedom Struggle. Sainaji delves into the unto untold stories of the ordinary individuals who played pivotal roles in India's fight for independence. His unwavering commitment to social justice and his relented pursuit of truth through journalism continue to inspire a new generation of changemakers and advocates for a more equitable and inclusive India. Sir, we once again welcome you to our seminar. Please. Thank you very much. Delighted to be here. It's been some years since. I came here, and uh, this is a classroom and a lecture room. I'm going to begin with a question to you. Okay. And it's not a rhetorical question. I expect answers. <laughs> now, uh, you all know that we are in, I mean, there's been endless amount of photographs of the Prime Minister over it. On uh, We are in the 75th year of our independence. Yeah. Questions for you guys. I mean, uh, what are we celebrating? Yeah, well, okay, so what are we celebrating? And again, it's not a rhetorical question. And who are we celebrating? Please tell me. Uh, now, the obvious answer to that is independence from British colonialism. From British rule. Okay. Yeah, but now we, we come to the question what was so bad about British rule? What did British colonialism do that led hundreds of millions of people to revolt, millions to lay their lives? Something happened. I'm going to ask you guys to give me the, you know, I think it's a very appropriate uh, question for, for, a, for students in the Institute of Management. What sort of, what sort of, what did they do to this country? What were the costs, your street, what were the costs of British colonialism? And who paid the price for that cost? Uh, can you keep a mic for them? So, can you, so you all have mic, one of them. Hi. Yeah, hi. Your name? Harsh. Yes. So one is oppression. The colonial powers were oppressing the large amount, like large common men and women in the country. And second is like the cost which we paid were the lives of millions, whether it was during the revolution, fighting through famine. We all have 
read about Bengal fam Bengal famine. They were living on the cost of Indians. Okay. Right. Anyone would like to elaborate, go further. You are absolutely right about the who paid the cost. But, you know, and also about Bengal famine. But there was more that happened. And what, what was the oppression about? What kinds of oppression? What other costs? Okay, what, let, let's, can you put a price tag on what the British looted from India? Which they did very successfully, very, very successfully, at unbelievable cost. I'm asking about the cost. And do you have a number on that? I think, uh, according to Shishi Saru, it's more, more than 45 million, but uh, 45 trillion dollars or something. It's not Shashi Kapoor's. Shashi Kapoor's But, uh, but uh, I yeah. think, uh, except of that also, there were many artisans and all those things, farming, traditional farming, genetics. Okay, I think those were racist. And uh, yeah. so that's all. Those were human costs. And the wiping out of whole areas of... We, we have stories from Bengal where they cut out their thumbs because they yeah. don't want to... Eastern weavers and, and the weavers of Dhaka Muslim, for instance, completely wiped out. Yeah. Correct? Anything else? Yeah. The ports are excavated. If I go as far as I know, I speak. The prime example being setting the Naranda on fire for uh, uh, such a long time. So maybe a correct depiction of the history was, is not really available with us. No. No, you, you're, you're right. I mean, actually, by the way, I'm I'm looking at a generation that was robbed, of, that has been robbed of its history. Half of them not aware that they have been robbed of their history. And my generation that doesn't seem to be aware that we, we did the robbing. Yeah. So that's true. But a little more specific, you know, the, the thing of robbing history. It is one of the most severe wounds you can inflict on a society. There's a very beautiful uh, African saying. Sachemak uh, quotes it, though it's not his own. Uh, I think it originates in the, in the Swahili language. If lions were historians, the tales of the jungle would not always favor the hunter. You know, if you go to, if you go to Bharatpur, the sanctuary, the bird sanctuary in Alber, you will see very proud monuments put up by British colonels and generals and, and our own lovely Raja Rani Log, boasting how many thousands of birds they shot dead in a single day. Okay? Some, totally the whole gang, 16,000 in one case. Something like that. It all adds up. How do you calculate those costs? Those are not tangible costs in that sense. Yeah. Uh, anything more? Yeah, you were saying something, sir. Oh yeah, there's the psychological. We are living and paying that psychological cost of... Because you can approach that psychological cost in two ways. One is, you can set about, as a group of historians in India did in the late 60s and 70s, trying to recapture our history. Or you can, as many people do, are doing now, unfortunately, revisiting history is a damn good thing. It's necessary. I, by the way, I was not trained as a journalist. I was trained as a historian. And uh, I've never been to a journalism school except to teach, which is now 37 years of teaching, 43 years in the profession. But the other way, in the late 60s, early 70s, a number of historians, Romila Tapur, Harbans Mukia, Ken, Panikkar, sought to recover that. Panikkar worked in the idea of, he's now settled in Bengaluru, uh, in the 
history of ideas. So very much coming to the psychological area that you're talking about. But now they revisited history and as every historian should when new evidence comes to light. It's a very different thing from inventing history, which is a huge, huge, huge problem in your country now. Just, I can say any, I can say any damn thing, and if the media are in my pocket, I wish, you know, I can get away with it. Never be questioned. You know, I can say, as the Prime Minister of this country said at the inauguration of the uh, Reliance Health Foundation. India knew plastic surgery 50,000 years ago. How else did we do? How else could there have been Ganesh with an elephant head? Okay. And then we knew genetics. We knew all sorts of stuff. Look at the birth of Karna. Okay. Now, this isn't revisiting history. It's fantasy. There are, at the Indian Historical Congress seven years ago, a paper was produced at the, at the, sorry, at the Indian Science Congress. A paper was produced on Pushpak Vimanam, you know, and neat diagrams of aircraft that are presumed to, no archaeological evidence, no literary evidence, no nothing, but they were astonishing aircraft because they could fly backwards, flap their wings in. We must have been really wonderful people, you know, and our ancestors must have hated us because they didn't leave us a single thing to verify. So that's one thing, revisiting and inventing are two very different things. Anything else on what colonialism did in real terms? Now you want to put numbers to it? Yeah. I think, sir, they also rob the generation of its dignity by telling them that no matter how good they are, uh, merit will not be a criteria for how high they can aspire to go. Uh, it would be that is, from the British. It is a colonial racist philosophy that, by the way, we, we practice that ourselves with many people. We have decided what their worth is and they can never be better. So, the thing is also, uh, Ravi Rup, let's come back to that 45 trillion, who said that you did, right? Your name? Trillion. Okay, uh, the figure, actually the first such calculation was done by, how many of you have heard of Dada by Nauroji apart from DN Road, Bombay? <laughs> What was his famous contribution to economics and study of economics? What was, the, was that what it was called? It was a book and he produced a theory of the drain of wealth. The book was? Un-British rule of in India. Poverty also. and un-British rule. That's what the title was, correct. Yeah. And in which he produced a figure for the drain and he was looking basically at tariffs, yeah? tariff barriers. And he concluded for the time the British had been up till there, up to there, in 1905 or so when he came out with the book, I don't remember the correct year, 1.6 billion pounds. Now this did not take into account, of course it could not take into account what happened in the next 41 years, 42 years. Nor could it take into account the loot in many other ways in taxes. The British, the East India Company devised the most brilliant system of loot that you could ever think of. I mean, it was entirely novel at that point. On the one hand, there were, incidentally, the number that you got uh, is from Professor Utsa Patnaik. She worked out the figures. Tarun may have quoted her. I hope he had the courtesy to acknowledge the source of his figure. But the figure came to 44.6 trillion dollars. 
to give you a sense of how much that is, just consider that here we are boasting every day that by 20, 25, 20, 30, we keep moving the goalpost. <laughs> we will be a $5 trillion economy. They looted 10 times that much. They looted 10 times that much by the year 1947. Hmm? Utsa did, does a calculation from, 19, from uh, 1765 to 1938. And she looks at the entire gamut, but she tells you very honestly herself, if you speak to her, she will, that this is not a calculation of what was looted, it was what was looted in trade and taxes. How do you calculate environmental loot? I mean, the loot of the forests. Do you know, guys, those of you who've been to London, and I'm sure every one of you at some day will be, so from IIM, uh, there's the famous Trafalgar Square. Do you know the admiral who was associated with that Battle of Trafalgar? Nelson. Every ship in the fleet that Nelson led at Trafalgar got its wood from a single district called Thane Palgar in Maharashtra. That's where the wood came from. Yeah. Where lakhs of Adivasis are still fighting for their rights under the FRA, which is not being extended to them, the Forest Rights Act. Hmm. Then how do you calculate the every one of your great English castles and uh, stately homes in the countryside they are wood paneled, they are wood floored, and what wood is that? Burma teak, Indian rosewood. These are the two woods that came, that made up the pub. Burma teak, Indian rosewood. Okay. How will you calculate ever the costs of that? Then, how many people actually die? You know the Bengal famine, it's because it's within your parents and grandparents living memory. How many famines did the British have? And by the way, you've never had one. From the day they left, you never had one. <laughs> From the day they left, you never had one. Not a mass famine claiming millions. There were 31 famines, out of which 24 are classified as major. There is the usual nitpicking and disputes between demographers and historians and, and of course, the economists. Uh, uh, on, you know, the economists are all about the numbers, which they have no clue where those numbers came from. <laughs> yeah, but they always, let me, let me digress a moment and take a shot at economists. <laughs> so there was this economist from a very prestigious think tank driving down the highway through the countryside. He was going to a party of all his old buddies, the reunion. He was a very big brain in a think corporate think tank which made policy for government, everything. He's going down and they were having a party where each one had to bring some food. Everybody had to bring some food. He had not got anything because he got late advising governments and all that. It takes time. So, uh, as he drove down, he saw in a very lonely area a shepherd with hundreds of sheep. Just one shepherd, his big dog, you know, sheep dog, and I mean, whatever that shepherd used, but big dog and that shepherd and just sheep as far as the end. Then he, he had an idea of how he was going to get something for the party. And of course, being an economist, it will never happen at his own cost, right? <laughs> so, uh, he... Uh, he gets down, across the shepherd and says, hey, bet you, bet you a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks or whatever it was against one of your sheep that I will guess the exact number of your flock. I will get the exact number of your flock. The shepherd said, ah, that's impossible. There are some behind the rock over there. There are some on the other side of the stream. There are some inside the damp trees. This guy can never, this guy is, you know, he's a flake. He can't give me the correct number. So he says, you're on. And the economist says, 973. 
and the shepherd is shell shocked because it's a correct number. The shepherd is completely shell shocked. And the triumphant economist picks up one of the animals and starts moving towards his SUV. When the shepherd says, hey, it's customary to offer double or nothing, you know, to a guy who's just lost a bet with you. So this guy is impatient. He's holding the animal. He wants to go on his visit. He says, okay, damn it. What, what will you do? He says, uh, double or nothing. I tell you the job you are doing, your occupation. This guy says, oh, nonsense. Who is this guy? Illiterate shepherd. Okay, so still clutching his prize, impatient to go. He has asked the shepherd, okay, what am I doing? Shepherd says, you're a leading, you're a leading economist with a prestigious think tank in the city. It's the economist's term, turn to be shocked. He's lost his prize, but he's still clutching it. How the hell did you know that? And the shepherd says, well, put my dog down and I'll tell you. <laughs> okay, so that's numbers and economists way. Uh, then anyway, so the Utsa will tell you very honestly that the environmental costs, the ecological system damage, the agroecological systems damage, Look, what did they do? There were thousands and thousands of Indian cereals, okay? I mean hundreds of them, of varieties which you eliminated and brought only rice and wheat. Why? Because they recognized rice and wheat. They couldn't understand what the hell ragi was about, though it's incredibly more nutritious than the polished rice that gives us diabetes. The glycemic index of Indian cereals is much lower. Foxtail millet, okay, as against rice, its glycemic index, it's about 40-50% lower. Kodo, Kodo millet, Foxtail, all these have much, much lower glycemic index. They didn't recognize these. And that's how, by the way, many of our cereals got names, which we continue to use humiliatingly. What did they do with your cereals? They fed them to their livestock, and that's how you have the name chickpea, horse gram, okay, cow pea, right? Those are the English names for these products because they were feeding them to feed pigeon pea, chickpea, pigeon pea, cow pea, and uh, horse gram. They were feeding them to their livestock, and that's how those names came, and we still continue it. And for 60 years until a few of us made a hell of a noise in the economic survey at the back, all these were classified as coarse cereals. Coarse cereals. They're incredibly more nutritious than the rice and wheat we eat, but they were classified as coarse. So the agroecological damage done by the colonial power in bringing exotic species, various species, cotton was brought from the United States. It was brought from Georgia which had actually looted it from uh, Senegal and Sierra Leone. But uh, with the slaves. Okay. Now here, how do you calculate the cost of colonial? How do you calculate it? Then let's back to go back to the famines. In the famines, you had 31 famines, 24 major ones. The first in 1772. And it there's a, something in it that will sicken you, and I want it to. The first famine, the giant Bengal famine, which claimed three times the number of lives that the 42-43 Bengal famine claimed, 12 million. You have Mr. Warren Hastings writing a letter to the board of directors of the East India Company. You know what the letter says? is boasting. Notwithstanding the loss of fully a third of the population, Purnia, Bengal, Bihar, notwithstanding the loss of fully a third of the population, hmm? 
the company has managed, I have managed, to retain and raise rents and revenues. They raise the rents. They raise the revenues. And from there they flow out that other system, very wonderful system. First they tax the artisans, they tax the producers massively. And then with a portion, about a third of that sum, which you can read about in Uksa, the explanations, uh, they purchase those items. So I'm purchasing from you money that I look, took from you in taxes. Okay? But only one third. Two thirds are still with me. Anyway, you have, um, then you have the Dora Baja family, the Skull family. First one was 12 million. Second one was 11 million. Then you come to the eight, win. you have 24, okay, about 5 million. And you come to 1876, the grand Darbar of Victoria, which she never <coughs> attended, but the costliest dinner party in history. We have, you have the record in the British records. Do you know how many guests there were? 68,000. Now, almost all these guests, were either royalty or aristocracy. I don't think they went to the party with their backpacks. Okay? They went with an, an entourage. That entourage included their horses, their carriage driver, the guy who cleaned, who fed the horses, the guys who cleaned the horses' shit. All of those people were there. So you're talking about all over the country, maybe a quarter of a million people at the very minimum involved in the celebration of Victoria's <coughs> ascent to the Darbar. You should see the loving message she has sent since then, at that time. But the important thing about the Darbar, it happens in 1870s. She didn't come because she feared indisposition due to the arduous journey across the seas, which might impair her digestion. So, you know, so though she was very grateful that we were all celebrating her Darbar, she, she passed on it. So, it, then... Uh, the same week of the Darbar, first week of the Darbar, that year, 1876, they are still, Democrats are still calculating, was it 8 million, was it 10 million people who died that year. Please note, costliest dinner party in history. Who paid for it, guys? Yeah, you did. Or your great, 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 great grandparents. They paid for it. Hmm. The costliest dinner party in history, outstripping anything that Nero had done in Rome, by the way. Outstripping anything Nero had done in Rome, uh, was held for her in a year and the taxes. At a time when you needed to put money into the public's hands, when you needed to increase purchasing power, when you needed to reach, buy and reach food to them, they held a party. They held this party in which, anyway, 8 million people at least now seems to be the bottom line of people dead. More importantly, in that first week, between, we are, where are we sitting? We are sitting in Bengaluru. Between Mysore and Madras city, in that first week, 140,000 people died. 140,000 people died of starvation and hunger. And you can read reports in the newspapers of that time of um, starving peasants trying to storm the barricades that the police had put up outside the cities to prevent them from entering. And these hungry people were clubbed to death at the barricades. Okay? These hungry people were clubbed to death at the barricades. Now the same newspapers report the pomp and glory of the Darbar, they report the uh, deaths and the hunger and the famine, but they never connect the two. But you know what? They're better than we are today. Today we simply would report the hunger and famine. We just tell ourselves, poverty has fallen by 415 million in the last 15 years. Okay? They're go, I mean, forget it. You know? I remember the brilliant cartoon by Oliphant, 
in Washington Post, uh, where Lincoln is making his famous Gettysburg speech. You can fool some of the people some of the time. First frame. Second frame. You can fool some of the people all of the time. Third frame. But you can't. And then somebody puts up a piece of paper under him saying, Reagan's latest poll figure, 86%. And in the fourth frame, Lincoln says, forget it, and goes in. <laughs> you know, it's something like that. So you had 140,000 people die. We won't report that. We, we, in fact, deny deaths like anything, right? We do. You know, if everybody in the world is conspiring against India, we are such absolutely wonderful, unique human beings. So, you know, in the Environmental Performance Index, you have set a record no other country can do it twice. You have touched 180 out of 180. In the Global Hunger Index, 107 out of 121 nations. Rwanda and Ethiopia do much better than you. Okay? Uh, in the United Nations Human Development, you are 132, the lowest you have ever been in the history of the UNDP um, human, human Development Index. You can look at every year, you're, you're familiar, right, that there's a UNDP <coughs> Human Development Report, HDR, in which towards the end, they give you a Human Development Index for 188 patients. You're 132. Yeah, I mean, the number of, in the World Press Freedom Index, you have fallen to 162, which, 161, which, you know, was really, an astonishing achievement. Yeah. Anyway, so, but of course, those are all Western conspiracies. They're jealous of us. Uh, and when we, when, again, what happens in the Victorian period, in Queen Victoria? Now, the entire thing, please read your history books. Find me any mention, any mention of the great party's costs. There is only one history book that actually covers it in detail. It's Mike Davis's brilliant book, Late Victorian Holocausts. Late Victorian Holocausts. Uh, I think he was a professor at San Diego, though he started life as a truck driver and died last year, uh, Mike Davis. So Mike Davis's, the first 60, 100 pages are compulsory, mandatory reading for every Indian to know what they did to you. Otherwise, Victoria's party remains a secret of history. You will not find that. You will find it in, in the memoirs of old civil servants, some of whom actually criticize. There are one or two old British civil servants who, in their mild language, criticize. You will not find it in the history textbooks. As far as the history textbooks go, the connection between the Grand Darbar and the lives of, loss of lives of millions of people, that remains a secret. Call it Victoria's original secret. Okay. And anyway, when, we went, when I went to college and school, which was a hell of a long time ago, we still had textbooks that would talk to us about the sun never sets on the British Empire, etc. My, I preferred the Irish revolutionary version of that. My, my granddad participated in the Irish uprising between 1914 and 1916, was very lucky to get kicked out and not executed. And the Irish had a different take on it. The sun never sets on the British Empire because even God can't trust those bastards in the dark. <laughs> now you guys laugh. But a few months ago, less than a year ago, we lowered the national flag to mourn the symbol of that colonialism, the monarchy of Britain. Queen Elizabeth. I don't give a damn how nice she was as a little old lady. I don't, doesn't mean a thing to me. Imagine what it meant to those of your freedom fighters who are still alive. 
speak to them. They are alive. They are articulate. One of them received on July on Ju July 15th, he received his doctorate at age 102. His name is M. Sankaraya and he's in Chennai. You can see it on online. It is, and he's one of the characters in my book. Okay. Uh, one of the things about the book, The Last Heroes, every story has a QR code at the end. It's for your generation. The QR code you scan, it goes to it goes to a gallery on the People's Archive of Rural India, of which I am founder editor. The same people who are in the book, you can see them speaking, telling you. Not all were on video because some of the interviews go back before video, but everybody had video on their phone. But you can see their families, their photos, their villages, their lifestyle, how they live, and explain why they sacrificed without getting anything in return. Hmm. They were broken hearted when you lowered your flag for all that they stood against and sacrificed and fought against. Okay. Now, what about the actual number of deaths? Do you know how much controversy we've had with COVID-19 deaths? You see, any number of sources, Johns Hopkins. By the way, I am not ever saying that you accept a source because it's a very big name or because I don't. I never do. My entire journalism has been functioned on calling the bluff of very big names. But if you take 10 major sources and estimates of how many people died in India, you'll find WHO, Johns Hopkins, Lancet, all of them giving you between 4 million and 5 million deaths in this country. But but when Vishwaguru's government says 4,86,000, that's the figure. No verification required. No proof required. Nothing required. We just suspend. It's called willing suspension of disbelief. We just suspend our disbelief and accept that this is the figure. 4,86,000. Yeah. Anyway, you know how they calculate excess deaths, right? A society has a given rate, a death rate every year, mortality rate, whatever you want to call it. it has, when in a particular year, it is, if, if, the, if that number of deaths, hypothetically, all these are bogus hypothetical numbers, so are the real numbers also. They are also bogus and hypothetical. 4,86,000 is simply bogus. It's not even hypothetical. Uh, the, the figures... If a, say, a given mythical society had 1 million deaths annually, if in a particular year it had 6 million, you would say it had 5 million excess deaths. I'm putting it very crudely and very badly, but it will help you understand what that means. Hmm. Do you know what the excess deaths in, uh, according to Vishwaguru, 4,86,000 is the excess deaths in India. Hmm. Do you know what was the excess debts under British colonialism? Anyone wants to hazard a guess? Well, we are discovering that we had Pushpak Vimanam that could fly backwards, you know, to do the backstroke. And, uh, so, you could, what, what would you think were the excess debts? That the, these are economic demo, uh, demographers and anthropologist demographers come together, who put all this together, weaving in what were the earlier estimates. By the way, the first estimates themselves came from British, uh, one journalist turned demographer, W.S. Digby and uh, William Lilly. Lilly and Digby were the two famous names. And one of them got so disgusted with the Holocaust that he saw that he turned against the British Empire okay? and remained a critic to the end. So this was the, he remained a critic to the end once this happened. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, Jason Hickel and Dylan Sullivan is not out of the blue. It's building on 
decades and decades and decades of demographic research going back all the way to Digby and Lily in the early 1800s. One of, one of the interesting things that the British demographers established, hmm, what was, you, you know, we are so obsessed with how India had a much greater share of the GDP, world GDP, in, when, when the British came to India, India had a much greater share of, and much less now. Actually, it should make you ask, what have you been doing since then that you have not been able to revert it? It means that everything you have been doing is wrong. The uh, British demographers showed us some very interesting things. What was the life expectancy of Indians when the British came, or within a hundred years after the British came? Which means it was even better before that. And what was it in a hundred years after the British came? You can find all these are available to you, I'm sure, in any major library in Bangalore. Hmm. The estimates, they, cal they calculated and found, and subsequently um, Rajni Palme, Dat, Navel, Hikel, and Sullivan, all of them tell you that when the English came to India, Indian life expectancy, yeah, were, uh, the life expectancy of Indians was greater than that of people in Ireland, Scotland, and Wales, and roughly equal to that of people in England. And by 1921 census, your at that time, by the way, when the, after 100 years after the British came, when that life expectancy in Britain was 37. So yours was also around 37. Yours was probably higher, and because they'd been there 100 years to screw you up right royally, you're coming now, but 1921 census, your life expectancy is 21 years and 9 months. 21 years and 9 months. That is a holocaust. That is a cost. Right? Is that a cost or is that a cost of colonial? They brought your life expect. By the way, we raised that to 71 and lost two years of it in the pandemic. In the, we were one of those nations which saw a decline in our longevity during two years of the pandemic. Okay? So you had this situation. How many excess deaths are the British? Want to guess anyone? Hundred and sixty-eight million, and they've, they've given you two ranges. They've given you three ranges of figures because it depends on what variables you use. Okay, but also you should remember at that time India was India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, and even I, there are there are years when Burma is counted as part of the protectorate. Think Ma Myanmar today, right? So it was a big, but it still would mean a third to bloody half of the population. A third of the population would have been decimated. Exactly as Warren Hastings calculated in his province. Second, what they give you as a clear, why do they start these figures in 1881? Because 1881 you have the second census. So from 18, before 1871, you are operating on data that you are guessing. From 1871 onwards, you have a census. And that means relatively more robust data. From 1881, you can compare with the first census. By the way, you can get the 1871 census on People's Archive of Rural India. We have digitized it for you. You can go and look at it. Then, but there is a period when British imperialism is at its peak. Sun never sets on the British Empire, all that stuff. 1881 to 1920. That is just before the 21 census. Because the 21 census will give you those figures. 1881 to 1920, not less 
than 50 million excess deaths. Now guys, tell me, if 1% of 1% of that had happened in a European country, you'd be screaming genocide. Right? Like they do in Bosnia and Serbia and other places. But since it's just worthless brown folk, it doesn't... Where is the sense of outrage that drove your freedom fighters to revolt? Yeah. This is what British colonialism did. I want to tell you this, guys. If you don't know where you came from, you will remain clueless about where you are going. A nation that doesn't know where it came from has no idea where it's going. Yeah. Now, what do we do then? I asked you the opening question, what are we celebrating? Ostensibly, we should be celebrating those who gave their lives and sacrificed everything else for freedom and independence. By the way, the moment Captain Bhav, in my book, Ramchandra Sripati Lai, the moment I was talking to him about that, he corrected me. Subsequently, every one of them, eight of them are still alive. You can even go and meet them. Every one of them corrected me when I used the words interchangeably. Captain Bao, the first line in the book says, starts with him. He corrected me when I spoke about freedom. And he said, we fought for two things. We fought for freedom and independence. We achieved independence. That's it. In one line, he, he just summed up everything that happened. We fought for freedom and independence. We achieved independence. After that, I put that question to every other freedom. There are many who are not in the book who I also put the question to. And they had a vision of your nation. And for them, each and every one of them, in their own context, in their own ideas, explained Freedom is a much larger project than independence. Independence was throwing out British rule. Freedom was something much greater. Freedom. And I asked them, where is that vision of freedom? And Asankaraya and others immediately will tell you. The finest distillation of those ideas of freedom you can find in the constitution of India, not just in the preamble, but in the directive principles of state policy. That's what they fought for. That's what Ambedkar, November 25th, 1949, in the last speech in the Constituent Assembly, before he handed over the Constitution, draft of the Constitution, when he handed it over, he said, I hand over this document in some trepidation. We are entering a world of paradoxes. Yeah. And he summarized in a few sentences how inequality was central to everything that had happened. And the different forms of inequality that exist in our society. All the freedom fighters I've met, and I, I was born in a freedom fighter family. Every one of them had this distinction between independence and freedom. And that's why you find that many of them in the book, Asakaraya is still making lectures at 102. And he's very, he's very peeved that his family doesn't allow him to go and make in-person lectures because he's had COVID only twice. <laughs> okay. And uh, at 99, that man, 98, he inaugurated the Tamil Nadu Progressive Writers Association meeting in Madurai, for which he traveled physically. Yeah. And uh, you can see the Hindu for the photo of Stalin giving him an honorary doctorate. Do you know why? This was the top student, top student of the Madurai, American College Madurai, the most prestigious college in Madurai, which used to vie with, for number one slot with Madras colleges. He was the number one student of the Madurai, and he was very, he was the joint secretary of the Students' Union. And he led agitation after agitation against the British. He was also the founder of the Tamil Poetry Society. He played football for the college and was ranking in the university. 15 days, 1941, February 21, 15 days before his final exam, he was jailed. 
and did not come out. He did the full jail tour of Madras province, Rajmandri jail, um, Madras jail, Bellore jail, Madurai central prison, all these released on the evening of August 14, 1947. And he, P. Ramamurthy, all those released with him, didn't even contact their families. They marched to the Madurai Tilak. There was a ground there, Tilagar, Tilagar Nagar, the ground where Bal Gangadhar Tilak had spoken 40 years earlier. It's named after Tilak, Tilagar, it's called. They all marched there to be part of the freedom at midnight rally. That was how important it was to them. Imagine how a Shankaraya felt when you lowered the flag to the monarch to mourn the death of the monarch of the British Empire. So he didn't get his degree. He never went back to college, though he was the top student. He would have topped the university. Yeah. And the stupid college never recognized him. And the book got Stalin, along with the letter, it got Stalin to Im immediately see that the Madurai Kamrajar <coughs> University bestowed him a doc let doctor of letters degree on July 15, which is his 102nd birthday. These are the sort of people. The, who are these people? I'm going to show you a few little snippets that are much longer. I'm going to show you two minute clips, three minute clips. By the way, one of them was from Bangalore. And what that, he was the, he's the only journalist in the lot. He's the only one in the book who completed his education when he finished a BA. Heard of him? His name was H.S. Doreswani. Right? You heard of him. He died at 104 the year before last. Now, uh, Doreswani, I mean, entirely hilarious character and uh, with a, blessed with a grand sense of humor, which you hope that, which you wish would infect some of your anchors who take themselves so bloody seriously. And um, instead of that pompous ranting, Guddare Swami was attacked by the then government in power and a minister, ex-minister and a MLA, or a leader of the RSS in Karnataka, called him a fake freedom fighter. After that, any journalist visits him, he was always busy writing something. But he, he loved playing this note on us. I would go to his house and He'd be right. What are you writing, Dore Swami, sir? I, I'm writing my CV, I said. I'm writing my CV. Apparently, it's being questioned in some quarters. Yeah. And mind you, this was the guy who had all his jail certificates and everything with him. Anyway, yeah. After independence, all the Dore Swamis, the Nallakannus, the Sankarayas, the Bhagat Singh Jugiyans, they continued to fight because they never recognized freedom as being part of independence. They said it's a larger project. It has to be fought for. We may never see it in our lifetimes, but we will fight for it. And one of the most wonderful things for me in the last four depressing years, one great thing was seeing across this country, teeny boppers standing at the gates of their college in the anti-CAA agitation, reading from the preamble of the Constitution of India. It showed me a continuity from, from Ambedkar and Nalakane and Sankaraya. It showed me a continuity that people were still identifying with those heroic values. Yeah. Remember 2019? How many thousands of kids, teenagers, were standing at the gates of colleges Though many of them were my students, and I would tell them, you know, there's a few other pages also worth reading <laughs> when you get past the preamble. But reading is something that's very, very difficult, as you know, to get students to do. I keep assuring my students every year that read, it's never killed anybody. But the look on their faces tells me that, yeah, maybe it's never killed anybody, but I don't want to be the first. So, Anyway, they don't read. 
Now, Doreswami, he was a journalist, the only journalist in the world. He comes to the, in Mysore, Doreswami was in the, involved in the Mysore Chalo movement, which was against the Maharaja of Mysore. Now, surrounding the areas were all under British rule directly. The Mysore Maharaja was indirectly. But surrounding those areas, Anantapur, Rayal Seema, were British rules. Doreswami wrote the editorial after editorial, criticizing the Divan Bahadur, talking about what freedom of speech, freedom of expression. And they started issuing notices and they locked his place down. He moved across the border into Anantapur and did something which just think if any journalist, editor, Malik, owner of media would even dream of doing today. He opened the newspaper in Anantapur with six titles. People's Voice, People's Choice, People's Champion, etc. So that Whenever they shut down one newspaper, the very same newspaper with the very same content from the very same authors and publishers would appear the very next day looking exactly the same except for the title. Many Indian editors did this in the freedom struggle because the press in this country was the child of the freedom struggle. Raja Ram Mohan Roy, you can say the founding, founder of an independent Indian press, closed his newspaper in, 19, in 1822, shut down his own newspaper rather than comply with laws that he said, quote, degrading and humiliating. He shut down the newspaper. Sorry to tell my bog friends that the newspaper was not in Bengali but in Persia, which was the language of the elite in that time, the Mughal court, etc. And of course, he was the journalist who knew ten languages. So he also, Kaumudi Sangba, in Bengali also he ran a newspaper. Okay? This is it. But imagine the ingenuity and the risk taking, that's a word you guys will use in a very different sense. Imagine the risk taking involved in the filing six titles, getting your newspaper closed, coming back the next day with the same content, continuing your attack on the government, continuing your attack on the oppressors of the Indian people. Yeah. What sort of courage and what sort of people did it take? Now, who were they? They were ordinary people. You know, your, free, your independence the freedom struggle was not the gift of Oxbridge returned elites. You know who says this very often? Who's the man who made this point very often? His name was Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. 1931. Prema Bhai Kantak writes a very adoring letter to Gandhi in Yerwada jail about his role. Typical of Gandhi, on the other side, he writes in one line, great men seem to be the cause of revolutions. In truth, the people themselves are the cause. When, as early as 1914, when returning from a triumphant Gandhi from South Africa, he is given a huge reception in London by the aristocracy of, the liberal aristocracy, Sar and Sarojini Naidu and other great figures, where everybody praises him and there is this, you know, Gandhi Chalisa recited on the stage. When Gandhi comes to speak, he says, your praise is directed to the wrong address. He says, it's directed to the wrong address. He says, I was just the face. I was just the face of what uh, happened in South Africa. I was their lawyer. If it, if that struggle succeeded, it was wholly and solely because of the indentured labor fighting for their rights. And he narrates stories that have the audience in tears. A Hathi Singh 
from Punjab, Gurdaspur. A released indentured laborer. Okay, he was released, went back to Punjab. But when the struggle began, remember what crossing the seas in 1913 and 1914 was. Okay, he comes back at age 75, and his cellmate is Mohandas Karapchan. And Gandhi is very angry with him and scolds him. You should be with your children and grandchildren in Punjab. What did you, how could you come back here? And Hathi Singh tells him, Gandhi, how could I not? When my people are fighting for freedom, how could I not return? Yeah? These were the kind of people. Bhagat Singh, in his beautiful correspondence with his friend Shiv Verma, says about the edifice of independence and freedom. Is, they're, they're both exchanging notes and one exchange says, we revolutionaries are just the decorative beautiful gems on the facade. The foundation is that of ordinary people. We did not build it. Malus Swarajam in the book says, we didn't go and lead people. People made us lead with their determination to fight. Okay. Now I'm going to show you some clips. Mallu Swarajim, I just want you to see the kind of spirit of these people. Mallu Swarajim, at age 84, you're going to see a clip, she died at 92, bordering 93. Mallu Swarajim was a fighter against the Nizam at age 13. She was killing Razakars with a with a slingshot. She was killing Razakars with a slingshot. You'll find her in the book. By the way, I got fired by her for the interview. See, when a, when a journalist is doing an on-stage interview, I've got to ask you some questions even if they're very dumb. Because the audience may not know. She, many of these people were very cantankerous. Okay? They spent 80 years of their lives fighting. Anything is seen as a challenge. Hmm? Anything you say is seen as a challenge. So, in front of that audience, by the way, the audience was 1,500 techies in Hyderabad. Techies working for ThoughtWorks. They're every day. And so I was asking her the questions in English so they would understand. And Professor Radhika was translating it into her answers because she didn't know English. And look at what reading means. She's 84. She doesn't know a word of English. They ask her, Swarajam Garu, uh, what can people like us do? We are techies. But before that, before that, I had to ask her the question. You were fighting the Rajakas at 13 with slingshots and killing them. By 16, she's holding a rifle and is the leader of the Telangana uprising all Dalams in the Warangal Bayaram region which was the nerve center of the uprising okay. oh, can you imagine guys can you imagine a woman of 16 being allowed to do that today she got it as she said because the people made us leaders and I had to ask I had to ask her that stupid question you know Slingshot is fine. I've seen Irulas, I've seen Bondas use it. They stun boars with it. They crack birds out of the trees with it. But is it really useful as a weapon of uh, close combat? She got angry because she had, she knew that I knew the answer and she thought I was being whatever. She, what did, what did this 84 year old do? She stood up, ramrod straight, whipped out a slingshot, put a cricket ball in it to show the audience how it was done. Then she saw the terrified young faces before her. And then she said, Odile, I'll take out the ball and I'll show you without the ball. Then they are. Okay, let me show you Manuswarajan. And you can see. Two minutes of Manus Varajan. I want to show you the three minute clip. Have a look.
By the way, to celebrate your 75th year of independence, the government of India put up a special website, the project 110 crores for the first time. I'll show you that website also. Uh, this is Malu Swarajim. I hope that sound is on. Uh, watch it. Okay. see what she looked like with a rifle at 16 as the leader of the Dalams. I just don't know what's with this accessibility investigate. Okay, got it. That's what happened. Just let's go back. My fault, I hit the zoom into <coughs> the volume. was placed by the Wazir of the Nizam on her head. 10,000 rupees in 1946, 83,000 kilograms of rice. That's her. At yeah. So, I'm not going to show you the rest of that. Uh, let me, I mentioned to you Captain Bao. 1943 was a critical year all over the world because British colonialism was up close to dying. The Nazi invasion of England was imminent. Okay? The Nazi invasion of uh, in, in England was imminent and all troops were brought back from different parts of the world to protect Mother England. What happened? In all colonies, many colonies across the world, Asia, Africa, Latin America, people rose in revolt 
and declared independence and secession. How many of, some of you may have heard of Chittagong revolt, but there were several other places in India. Koraput, uh, Midnapur, now Midnipur, and Satara was in many ways unique because it was so close to the heart of the Bombay presidency. In Satara, things were terrible. 1943, remember, Bengal famine prices were affected all over the country, not just Bengal. <coughs> and Captain Mao was the underground leader of an underground army called the Tufan Sena. Now, there's a lot of material on them in the newspapers at the time, everything. But we don't honor them. The, the Tufan Sena was the armed wing of a government called Prati Sarkar. So there was the Telangana uprising from 41, 43 onwards, Satara from 43 onwards. Do you know that these guys in Satara actually captured 600 villages? And this man, again, another old cantankerous guy, I loved him like a father, but you know, I asked him, again, I have to do those dumb interviews, right? I have to ask him, when did you join the Tufan Sena? He flips. You can see it in the video. He's saying in Marathi, for the information of peace I know. He's asked, basically, he asked me, what do you mean when did I join? I founded the damn thing. <laughs> okay? He was pretty pissed off. Then, he was 94 when I did that interview. He died at 100 last year. And he died just before the book came out. Yeah. Anyway. Um, Captain Bhau, they looted, they, they looted British, they looted British armories, treasuries, etc. They pulled off, the Tufan Sena pulled off the biggest train robbery. They pulled off the biggest train robbery in Indian history up to that point. 19,500 rupees was the payroll of the it belonged to one pay, one installment of the payroll of the Bombay Presidency. It was on the train, special goods train between Neeraj and Pune. And they hit it. When I got in touch with him, his family said, some days he's great, some days he's foggy. You'll be, if you're lucky, he'll be on a good day. I said, let's create a good day. I took his chair and him. We, People's Archive of Rural India, took his chair, we took Captain Bao, his family members accompanied us, and we took him to the very spot on the railway line where he had hit the train. And he hit the, we seated the chair on the, next to the track at that spot. He sat silently for one, for five minutes he sat in silence. Then everything came back. He named names of each member of the two squads. First of all, he told us two squads. We didn't know. And then, wo patil ka ladka hai na? Wo. Wo bhi tha. That's all. One by one, astonished villagers around him, looking at him, mentioning their grandfather, their great-grandfather, by name, and saying these were the people in the squads. So then, uh, he was the guy who said, we fought for freedom and independence, we achieved independence. I asked him about the train and what was the, wasn't there a lot of shooting? And he said, huh? Who owned guns? <laughs> they stopped them with stones and we grabbed, he said, huh, one rifle we got because the guard on the train was so terrified, he just gave us the rifle. Yeah. Then he again loses his temper when I ask him about looting the train. He says, we looted nothing. The British looted the Indian people. We brought a small person back. That was his... I mean, just see the attitude, okay? Just see that spirit and the attitude of this guy. He was no... Captain Bhav is like Captain Dada, Captain Elder Brother.
Okay, I got it. Oh, now, Ramchandra Sripati Lad. Well, I'm Captain Bhau, yeah, now I'm going to be here for it. It's a star of the world. English is a very good chance to have 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 a very Farmers' protests began. It began not in Delhi or Punjab, but in Nashik, when 40,000 peasants marched all the way to Mumbai, barefoot. And <laughs> in his town of Sangli, in Sangli, Captain Bau came out on the streets and started marching. And I, I ring him up and say, Captain Bau, you know, it's bloody 40 degrees. What are you doing out in this crowd? He says. Then also we fought for farmers and laborers. Now also I will fight for farmers and laborers. Look at that tenacity and spirit. That willing to die but not to be defeated. You will find something else in the book that you will not find in your conventional histories. The way we define freedom fighters, the, we, we excluded Tens of thousands, if not millions of people, especially the biggest exclusion was <laughs> women freedom fighters. Because we defined what men did as the freedom fight. Though hmm? so Manus Marajam did that and more. Yeah? But by the way, Sankaraya, Manus Swarajam, uh, the uh, Hausabai Patil R. Nallakanne, they refused the freedom fighters' pension. Sankaraya said, we fought for freedom, not for pension. But the government, in its wisdom, tied recognition and pension together. 
So millions of people were not recognized because it would mean spending money. Women were excluded in tens of thousands. One of the most fascinating characters I have ever met was a woman who half, half the day that I was at her house at age 104, Babani Mahato, half her day she denied strongly and hotly that she was a freedom fighter. She said, my husband was a freedom fighter. He went to jail and all that. You are 20 years late. You should have come earlier to interview him. So I was very disappointed. I had gone a long way to meet her. But the more we, by the time I left, I realized that she was 20 times the freedom fighter her husband was. You know what she did during the freedom struggle? At the height of the... I told her, you weren't too involved. She said, what did I do? I fed a large family of 25, joint family of 25. I got married at 9. She didn't get married at 9. Hmm. I fed a large family of 25 people. And then she said, my husband went to jail. I said, things must have been very hard for you when your husband went to jail. She said, no, it was much harder when he came back. <laughs> I got interested. I said, why do you say that? She said, each time he would come with 20 people and I had to feed them. Then we had to feed them in the forest. You know what she was doing? This woman was growing food. Okay, She was cultivating the land, growing food, transporting the food herself home, feeding a family of 25 and for two months at a stretch, at the height of the bloody Bengal famine, she was feeding fugitive revolutionaries in the forests of Colombia. Unbelievably more risky than getting arrested and going to jail in a satyagraha. The rip. She would. She was cooking for 25 people at home, 20-25 people in the forests of Purulia. Yeah, her husband's fellow travelers. All left-wing underground revolutionaries. Now, what courage and what you know, determination and st just to cook food for 50 people a day directly. And she was doing this and feeding them at the height of the Bengal famine. For me, that is more than 10, her, 10 people of her husband's group put together in terms of a contribution. The, other, two other astonishing women, Salihan. Incidentally, the Adivasis of this country, freedom struggle did not begin in 1885 with the formation of Congress by Alan Octavian Hume. It began days after the Battle of Plassey, when the Adivasis of Jungle Mahal in West Bengal even now they are fighting. You know, they fought against the East India Company and led a revolt that lasted 40 years. 40 years up to 1806. And historians, all upper caste historians, very derogatorily called it the Chuar Rebellion. Chuar is, in Bengali I understand, Chor plus Nietzsche. It's a very dirty term, Chuar Rebellion. But it tells you who were the people who fought it. Adivasis and Dalits. They were the people who first fought the British in the Jungle Mahal. Then come, before it, long before 1857, a hundred years before the first shot was fired in 1850, 90 years before the first shot was fired in Meerat or Kanpur, there were Adivasis fighting with bows and arrows. Birsa Munda comes much later. There was Siddhu Kano, Murmu Kano of the Santal, the great Santal Hur, who fought against cannons with bows and arrows. 20,000 of them, one third of their entire mobilization wiped out in two days and they kept fighting. Okay. Till they were captured in prison, died in prison, whatever happened to them. This was the courage with which your ordinary people Freedom was not the gift of Oxbridge elites. Gandhi understood this. Bhagat Singh understood this. 
we have forgotten it. We have chosen to forget it. The book, the freedom fighters in the book are farmers, laborers, cooks, couriers, homemakers, carpenters, laborers, you name it. That's who they are. Ordinary people who made your revolution. Hausa Bai Party is the last. Salihan never was part of any political movement. She fought for the right to her forest and her descendants still fight for their right to their forest. In 1930s, when the Sort Satyagraha began, what did the landlocked areas of India do? The landlocked areas of India had a forest Satyagraha. Refusal to pay taxes. The British had brought new taxes on timber. All of this. They fought those, they fought those taxes. Salihan's father was an underground congressman who held a lot of meetings. Hmm. Karthik Sabar. Sabar is one of the poorest tribes of Odisha. The Sabars are one of those tribes whose entire history has been stolen, appropriated by upper castes. By the way, your <coughs> Lord Jagannatha of the Lord Jagannath Rath in Odisha, he was not the property of the Brahmin Pandas. He belonged to the Sabar tribe. He was known as Neela Madhava. That's who he was. Around 12th, 13th century, the Kshatriya Rajas and the Brahmin Pandas appropriate Neela Madhava, who becomes Lord Jagannath. Even today, if you go for the return of the Rath, you will see from the hills tens of thousands of Adivasis descending from the hills because he was an Adivasi deity. He was. They don't come out for other deities, they come out for that deity, for the Jagannath Rath Yatra. Salihan, and in her villages, in what is now that Kalahandi, Bulangi, Koraput area, but Kalahandi, Kariyar. Her father was having a meeting. She was a 15 or 16 year old girl, unmarried, that's why the same village. Otherwise, you get married, you go off to another village, right? The village was called Saliha. And her name was Devati Dei Sabar. Uh, this extremely demoralized tribe who had their god stolen. They were hunter-gatherers mainly. Very little agricultural production. They were hunter-gatherers. They were taken away. Uh, they were raided by the British. And the common British method, by the way, costs of colonialism. What did they do when they were, you were a rebellious village? or suspected of being one, they came and burnt all your food grain supply. They set it on fire. So you would starve. Common practice. You can thousands of references to it in the literature and in the records. They set fire to this food oblivion. So suddenly Salihan and Saliha, Demati and 40 girls are working in there in the forest, all of them armed with lattice because she explained, those days we had huge apes, monkeys, cheetahs, you know, leopards, kabhi kabhi baad bhi aati thi. So you had to be, and you had to have a lati and you had to know how to use it. They were all there when a little boy came running and said, they've shot your father. <coughs> so she ran and about a minute or two later, the other 40 girls also ran when they realized the boy said they're setting all our home foods, food grain supplies on fire. There was a platoon of British security personnel in the village. She runs into the village, sees her father lying on the road with this guy standing over him. Karthik Sabar's thigh has taken a bullet and he's bleeding madly. She loses it. She takes her lati and goes and smashes the guy to bits. She chases him around the village beating him, whereupon the other 40 girls attack the remaining members of the plateau. And a bunch of 40 girls, all below the age of 16, because they are unmarried, still in their own village, chased out the British platoon of security forces, which had, uh, you know, a jeep, which had guns, hmm? they, had, they had weapons, and these girls armed with lattice defeated and threw the platoon of British, of the British army, uh, of the security forces 
out of their village. Then she goes, gets married, goes to another village, Purena, where her family descendants now are. There she is called Salihan. You are from Saliha, you are a woman, Salihan. Sixty years later, I mean, I see her six, 60 years, 50 years later, 60 years later. She is living in utter poverty, starving, and can't remember half the time until I remind her of, you must have been very angry when you saw your father shot. That moment, like Captain Bow at the railway line, she remembered everything, and she spoke with such anger as if it had happened that morning. And she showed me a certificate the government of Odisha had given her, local government, not even the state, as a recognition of her uh, Samman Patra, letter of honor for her role in the freedom struggle, which praises her for two achievements, one being the daughter of Kartik Samar, and two for having given birth to three sons. She had three daughters also, but that's not an achievement, right? Yeah. This is how we treated those who brought you freedom and independence. Hausa by Patila, that's the last one, was part of the Tufan Seda. Her father was the head of the Prati Sarkar. She wouldn't even listen to him about not going out and you know doing things that she could do. No. She went out and created havoc. In 1943-44, she was the most wanted woman in Maharashtra. Well, you know how the, what this woman did? Her story begins with her being brutalized by her husband in front of a police station in Sangli, just outside the railway station. He is thrashing her. And of course, the policemen are sitting calmly inside the station. Man beating wife, national sport. <laughs> What's so great about that? Why should we? Then he picks up a rock and says, I'm going to smash your skull. Now, that's a different thing. A murder committed on the doorstep of the police station will have uncomfortable questions to answer to your superiors. So they go out, and she is begging her brother, take me with you. I can't go back with this man. He's going to murder me. Brother being good Indian brother says, no, no, you are his property. You have to go back with him. Then the police intervene and half an hour, one hour wasted in reconciliation and then tell them, okay, now that you guys, they get husband and wife to reconcile. Hmm. Uh, and say, now just get out of our police station here. Get on to the bloody train and go back to your bloody village. We never want to see you again. The couple says, we don't have money for tickets. Police say, just get on to the train. Police get the tickets. Hausa Bai told me 74 years later, I have never figured out whether the police paid for the tickets or not. But they came and put two tickets in my hand and said, Amma, just let us see the last of you now. The police went back to their station. While this whole drama was going on, they found that Hausa Bai's comrades in Tufan Sena had looted the police station of all its weapons, all its money, all its ammunition. That was not her husband. That was a fake drama. Nor was it her brother. That was also the entire drama was staged to draw the police out of the station and loot the station. And she did that in two, three places. Different kinds of drama staged. They got that. 74 years later, I'm asking her, what is the most, you know, sharpest memory of that incident? She says, she's laughing, okay, but she says, oh, that scoundrel comrade, he hit me too hard. <laughs> then I said, did you tell him? She said, I was screaming at him not to, but he was saying, it has to look authentic. Only then the police will come up. <laughs> and she was laughing as she was saying it, but she said, I remember each blow on my back. That's what I remember sharpest. And then the next year, she sails on her chest, using it as a raft, 
with six Tufan Sainiks swimming around her at midnight across the Mandovi. This was no midnight cruise on the Mandovi. Okay? Mandovi was and even now has lots of crocodiles. And this was from Goa to Ratnagiri. And the seven of them, six Sainiks <coughs> swimming, she said, I could swim, but you know, I could swim in the village tank or in our canals. But Mandovi, I didn't trust myself to be able to swim across. So they found a fisherman's box, a huge box, wooden box. She lay on her stomach and paddled. And around her, what a sight it was. At midnight, seven people, it's made for a film. It's absolutely made for a film. Nikhil. Hausa Bai Patil, age 94, sends a video to the farmers protesting in Singhu and Tikri. Let my health improve a little, I will come and be with you. This was, this was the kind of thing. Guys, I mean, every type of person that you can imagine was part of what was a truly pan-Indian struggle. And you'll find them in the book. There were Dalits, Adivasis. It was not a bunch of upper caste returnees from Oxbridge. Dalits, Adivasis, Muslims, an extra, extraordinary <laughs> eccentric Muslim, Baji Muhammad, who died during the pandemic, alas, at 102, who the greatest beating he ever received in his life after the story begins with that, where he has his skull smashed open, and then he reveals that was in 1992 at the Babri Masjid, not under any British jail. And the, the guys who beat him up, the car saver, didn't know that this particular Muslim was also the president of the Odisha Anti Council Association. You got all sorts of idiosyncrasies and eccentricities across the peninsula. All of them had their peculiar, you know, characteristics and eccentricities. You had, I mean, person after person, and I met hundreds of them. Okay? And they are, by the way, not all up north. It didn't all happen in UP and Bihar. Long before the first shot was fired in UP, from the south, the great battles of Kattabomba, Veera Pandya Kattabomba. Then, the Pusulta, the only Indian prince who died in the battlefield. Please look for anyone else. Anyone else. Died in the battlefield. Never compromised. Neither his father nor he. Then the whole, that, that was the width, scope, breadth of that struggle. That's who your freedom fighters were. There are atheists also. Muslims, atheists, Sikhs. Bhagat Singh Jugiya, who his last words to me after he came to raise the flag in, Jal in Jalandhar at the uh, memorial for the Gadar party fighters. Asked him, what do you think of present day India? He said, it's terrible, it's very bad, what these people are doing, spewing hatred. And then he ended with one great line. But believe me, the sun will set on this Raj as well. That's what he said. That was the last words he ever said to me. At 94, he was organizing every day in Hoshiarpur food supplies for the protesting farmers of Singhu, Tikri, and Shaya. Every day, oil, supplies, vegetables, collected from all households in his village and sending it there. They remain active to the end of their lives. Thank you, guys. Thank you for putting up with so much patience for all. And you still have the time. I'm willing to answer questions. Yeah. You got a mic there.
actually wanting to uh, attend, like I've watched the documentaries, read articles and seen interviews and whatnot, uh, but to listen to you in person has been an absolute pleasure. And I'm getting goosebumps and in tears uh, Thank you. simply talking to you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I have one request, uh, uh, like uh, this talk was about the freedom fighters and ordinary Indians and people who uh, you know have really made uh, their lives for the freedom. I would request if you could spend 10 minutes on uh, Indian agriculture, where it is today and where it is headed, and uh, uh, what it takes to better the system. See, uh, if you could spend 10 minutes. I only, I only have two points to make because that's another conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. but I'll tell you this. One connection that will be between that freedom struggle and agriculture. 1857 was not a sepoy mutiny, and even our own people call it sepoy. Just because the British couldn't pronounce sepahi doesn't mean we should also make the mispronunciation. <laughs> the British were as murderous with pronunciation as with people. 1857 was not a sepoy mutiny, it was an agrarian uprising. The Indian Sipahi was a peasant in uniform. He had to reflect the mood of his village. In Singhu and Tikri, last two years, what did you see? You saw thousands of ex-servicemen come there. Retired colonels with their medals. Retired brigadier generals with their medals. Coming and sitting there. Because they, they told me, while you guys are calling us Khalistanis and anti-nationals in the media, our sons and grandsons are defending your borders. Yeah. The Indian army, something that the idiots who formulated Agni Pat and Agni Veer. Agni Veer is not a recruitment program, it's a retirement program. They don't understand. The Indian Kisan is a Jawan in uniform. The Indian, yeah. His Indian Jawan is a Kisan in uniform, right? And has been for 200 years. So that's the connection. The other thing I can tell you, which you made me think about, I promise you one thing. Go When you go back home in your holidays or whenever, when you go back home, you want to know how great and how broad this freedom struggle was. Talk to your grandparents. Some of you might be so young that you might even have Great grandparents, talk to them. You will find every family has a story. Every family, you will find a story of the freedom struggle. There will be some families, 0.001% whose stories they don't want told. But all of you will find stories that need to be told, that need to be recorded while your grandparents are alive. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, hello, sir. Uh, you kept talking about freedom. So before that, I want to make one quote, very famous one. Hey, mere watan ke logo. <laughs> Say it. So what do you mean by freedom? What did they mean by freedom? I s explained that. Hey, mere watan ke logo, jara aakh mein bhar lo pani, jo shahid huye hai unki yad karo karwa. Yeah. What did I mean? I think I touched on it briefly. To explain more, all of them identified with the values embedded in the Constitution of India, in the Liberty, Equality, Fraternity. Ambedkar has a brilliant speech explaining that you can't choose one or out of the three, you cannot choose two out of the three. You either have the whole package you know, he says lots of people in India are willing to have liberty and equality without fraternity. There are people willing to have liberty, but no equality. As he handed over the draft constitution on November 25, 1949, he said, we are entering a world of paradoxes. Today, there is, we have built a democracy in which there is Democracy in politics or equality in politics, but there is no democracy, no equality in society and economy. 
And as long as this is the situation, which is exactly the situation in 2023, the tensions between political democracy and lack of it in social and economic terms will explode this fine edifice that we have so endeavored to build. Inequality. And that's what all of them fought against. They identified so much with the fight against the British because they were fighting against unbelievable levels of inequality. Just, you know, it's very interesting what, how the preamble is worded, the order. Justice, social, economic, and political. I don't think it's an accident that they started with social. Justice, social, economic, and political. And then liberty, equality, fraternity. And very importantly, whether they used, whether they knew of the directive principles or not, they were identified things which I could find in the directive principles. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to know uh, what was the process you followed uh, in identifying these people uh, because cl clearly they, they, they're not as celebrated as they should be. And what kind of position do they um, enjoy in their own communities? Are they recognized for their efforts or uh, what is their Locally, life like? Yes. Locally, yes, but forgotten by newer generations. Captain Bao was a legend in his time. You know, you saw in the movie where, in the film where he said, where you tortured, we asked him, where you tortured in prison? He said, nah, I was treated like the king's royal guest. Raja Kigaya. You know why? Because he was jailed in his own area. Every warden and cop in the jail was salaming him and touching his feet. They knew who he was. They knew, they went back to the same villages that he controlled. That's why he said, they treated me like the king's guest. Okay. So, there were others who were tortured horribly. Like Bhagat Singh, Ajugya and... But the, were they known locally? Well, yes. Firstly, how did I process? How did I find? One, I am by training a historian. And my PhD, unfinished PhD, much to the chagrin of my old PhD guide, Dr. K. N. Panikar, was on revolts in the colonial army. Hmm. And I studied history under the finest set of Indian historians or historians of India ever assembled under one roof. Romila Thapar, Bipan Chandra, S. Gopal, Sarvapali Gopal, S. Bhattacharya, Harbans Mukhiya, K. N. Panikar, D.P. Chattopadhyay. Chato These were India's greatest historians. They still are. I still maintain my touch with Romila, who was my favorite teacher. We learned a kind of history there that overthrew all the crap we were taught in school and college. That what, why did people fight the British? That's what I, I started this class with. I started this lecture with what was so bad about them that you needed to be? And second, who fought? As I said, so we learned, I, I knew which were the areas where major revolts had taken place. For me, two are more important than anything else. One is the Gaddari areas. Two is the Adivasi areas, the Gaddari areas of the revolt which was, to my mind, but two people, the Gadaris and in Andhra Pradesh, Alluri Sita Ramaraju. Perhaps the most romantic revolutionary ever. You know, this guy, by the way, he dressed like a sadhu, but he never wore saffron. He wrote, he wore red. And he was inspired by the Russian Revolution. Okay. And Alluri Sita Rama, his name was not Sita Rama. Imagine, will you find a man in 2023 who would do what he did in, in 1917? He, he loved a woman called Sita. And now we have no way of knowing why she died, how she died. There are various... Uh, he was underground. He was a fugitive. Aluri Sita Ramaraju fought the British and defeated them time and again 
in the first time they were forced to fight guerrilla warfare in India. In, in Asia, the first time they fought guerrilla warfare was in, in Asia, was in India, in Andhra Pradesh from 1910 to 1925. When, uh, you know that for the next 40 years, his tactics were studied at Sandhurst, the Royal Military Academy of Britain. How a guy with 80 people, never had more than 80 people at one time. He, what he would do, he would attack a column of British or whatever institution and all the villagers, the Koyat tribals from the surrounding villages would come conduct the attack, finish the battle, and disappear back into their forest villages. That's how Aluri Sitarama Raju fought. At no time did the man have more than 80 people assembled. Usually he had 20, 25. It mystified the British, and that's why they studied his tactics in the Royal Military Academy. At Sitarama Raju, underground, comes out when he hears of Sita. His name was Aluri from the village, Ram Chandra Raju, from an area of the Godavari, which is called the Godavari Ram, Rampa Fituri, the uprising. And the legends and the songs and the literature are about how the Godavari was on fire when he fought. <coughs> I've been to the police stations he attacked. You can still see the bullets embedded in the walls of the Rampa Chodavaram police station. Yeah. And uh, that wall has been mercifully so far preserved. So when I, when, when he found that Sita had died, he showed up for the funeral. Again, legend. Yes and no, both sides have a say. But what he did, which we do know, he declared from today, my name is not Ram Chandra Raju. I take the name of my lover. I will be called Sita Rama Raju. Can you imagine how, how many males do you know today who would do that? Hmm? Not many. No? He took the name of his fiance and attached it in front of his own name. This sort of romantic revolutionaries, the Gadaris were like. The Gadri Babas were like that. Very romantic. Very, very romantic. Yeah. And so I knew which regions where. I knew where to look in Punjab. I knew where to look in Andhra. I knew about the Telangana struggle, which some of my own family had been involved in. Two generations removed. So I knew where to go. Second, locally, they are known. You know, I would go to Sherpur in, Ga in Ghazipur district of UP and ask, uh, are any freedom fighters there? They'd say, no, they're all dead. Lekin, Shahid Putra to mul sakte hai. Martyr's children. So they, they pass down that title. Okay? There is some sense of history there which you and I have forgotten or forsworn. I, it was, I found more of them than I could accommodate. And I wanted geographical representation. They are from all parts of the country except the Northeast. They are from North, Northwest, South. Uh, and by the way, there are more people from Odisha in the book than any other place. Because you really have no idea how the Adivasis of Korapur and Kalahandi fought. So yeah, the historian background made all the difference. So, sir, it, it was truly an honor to uh, listen to you regarding uh, the impact of British rule in India, the contribution of the freedom fighters, and finally knowing the nuances between independence and freedom, which we were totally unaware of. So, thank you for actually bringing us closer to our roots. Thank you. Sir.